It's great to be here. Finally, after all these years, it's been a long time coming and I'm involved in the first 4G conference. So like, my talk will be about a little brief history of how we as Pacifica Islanders got involved with first 4G and more like a roadmap from then to now and where we, we see it going. So without further ado, this love affair that we've had with first 4G is kind of like, kind of not, not exactly in 1998, more like in 1997. There was a project funded by European Union, Lombe Shri, for a GS project for utilities. And most fortunately enough at the time, I was with a power utility. And back then, what we had, like we had some paper maps, we, built, we had our own grid, like 200 meters by 200 meters, and we had some, some data inside a database, DBase 3 and DBase 4, and we wanted kind of like to link these two. So with this project, we were fortunate enough then to kind of get involved with GIS. So in 1997, the project started and I was more or less the pilot of the project for Tonga Electric Power Board at the time. So why, why force 4G? Because like at, at the time it didn't exist. But for us as Pacific Islanders, if you can look in our customs and our traditions, we like to share stuff. Basically, we just wanted to share knowledge and common solutions to common problems. So the package that was deployed with this charge for utilities was MapInfo. And luckily enough, it comes with a end-end Map Basic that you can run some scripts to customize MapInfo. So we developed some, some customization. And in order for this project to be transferable, we had to share the, the code base. So in 1998, Myself and another colleague of mine, and some of the people in the community that we started, basically from the power utility um, community, we wrote a programming manual on Red Basic that we shared with all the other Pacific Islands. So you can find it here online if you have an interest in looking at it. But this is the beginning of, for myself, as free as in freedom for open source software for geospatial application. So that's like how it's all started. So from 1998, 7, 1998, unfortunately enough, by 1999, 2000, the funding ended. We kept on sustaining the solution. We adopted it in Fiji, Solomon Islands, PNG, and in Samoa, I'll talk a bit later, in 2007. But then the bio company I worked for was privatized. Somehow I was Again, fortunate enough to get to go back to academia. So from then, whoop, what happened here? From that, from that uh, period, from then up to 2009, well, basically I was in uh, academia. Most of the guys kept rolling with the project. And I went back home and finally got another chance to go back and do GI stuff, but this time with the uh, uh, South Pacific Geoscience Commission, and it's now SPC. So I st we started working on a project in 2008 called High Cost Project, and this was, I think, the most impact breakthrough that we had with, with Phosphor G solutions for the Pacific Islands. When, with um, this project, I think the people from New are here, they have this real cool tool called TIDIRA, or Time Dependent Data Database, that we use to archive all the hydrological data. So, oh, what happened here? And we tied it up, like I said, this is a real breakthrough that we had uh, with, uh, with uh, first 4G. In 2008, I realized that some of the, some of, some of the workers at SOPEC were using quantum GIS, and they were just using it for, for print composer to print some maps. So at the time, I started looking into quantum GIS and using it. 
So in 2009, in 2008, two good things happened. Got introduced to quantum GIS and also to post GIS. So what we did with the data that we had in Tidida, we got like the DLL uh, library files from newer, and we also get to link to the pull out the data from Tidida. We put it onto a CSV file and we pump it up to post GIS and we pull it out into quantum GIS and display it on, on, on our maps, right? And this was our model back then. This is our design. What we designed at SOPEC at the time, we wanted to keep our tabular data separate from our spatial data. So the original approach of the methodology before was like, we had like our tabular data in MapInfo, and we kept all the tabular data in XS. But as time went through and people wanted more to have an like enterprise solution. So you need to have like a client server environment. So with, in 2009, that's how we got involved with PostGIS. So we have PostGIS in the back end with Postgres and we have our front end for in quantum GIS. So this was the design we had then. From Tarida, we have the time series data. We put it out using the library, uh, the, the DLL uh, dynamic library and ODBC and put it on an access database. We pumped it from there to Postgres and PostGIS, and then we pulled it out using quantum GIS. So at this time, and this was this is quite a, um, a breakthrough that 2009 GIS remote sensing conference in Suva. After the conference, when we had the conference dinner, some of the guys from SV told me to be very careful. So this became personal for me then. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I was totally driven to keep carrying on with Cosm GIS and promoting it and advocating it in the Pacific Islands. So let's start it out. So I'm just going to switch back to my presentation. So that was 2009. So 2009 to 2012, we deployed, we looked after 14 countries that are databases and also GIS for rainfall data and yeah, riverfall and river flow and rainfall data. In 2012, I decided to move on on my own and start to have a startup called Chase Spatial, just doing consultancy work with the, just around the Pacific Islands. And this is my presentation then on how we get involved with, I mean, like more like advocating for 4G. But the best thing happened in 2012 that we got involved with OSGO. We, more or less, the community that we had then wanted to start with thinking about having a chapter of the Pacific Islands, right? So mainly because, like, I think you also all know why we are all here. So, like, why 4G? So maybe you are in the wrong country. So, yeah, you, you already know that. So that's the best thing that happened in 2012. We got involved with Force 4G. So we, we started up a chapter. <coughs> 9th of November in Fiji. But again, this is something we can discuss with the Oceania chapter during the AGM because like, like it's like forking a, a software. Like, like I'm kind of like developing stuff on Linux and stuff. If you're going to have a distribution, if you fork it out, you've got to have a community of people to support you, right? And somehow this, this worked out well in 2012. We had like these people interested in it. So you can see like there's a list of people in it. But suddenly, oh, I'll talk about it as we go through. So like from 2012, you can see like we deployed a GI server with ListMap and all this stuff with mines and minerals in, uh, uh, in Solomon Islands, SIEA, Solomon's uh, Electricity Authority, and also with PNG Power. Full-fledged enterprise solution using QGIS on the back end, post-GIS, and on the front, front end QGIS, and list map for web, web mapping. So in 2013, we keep carrying on doing this. So 13, 14, 15, Got involved with, uh, some of you might know Vasiti. She was with the Sugar Industry Tribunal. They had a full-fledged uh, open source solution for mapping sugarcane farming and crushing and all these things. 16, still vibrant. And then 17, I got a chance to start working for the University of Fiji, not as 
directly be involved with GIS, but as more like on the IT side of things. But you see, my passion for for phosphor G never left me. So I kind of like got together with one of the professors that had the science uh, science department to have like a geo for all lab because he was also interested in 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 uh, phosphor G as well. So. This particular chapter. Sorry, I kind of like jump ahead. In 2013, SPC came out strong with Phosphor-G. They did some really cool stuff with Phosphor-G. They're basically doing a lot of stuff with GeoNode. They're using good quantum GIS as well. And a colleague of mine, I think he's still the geospatial architect for SPC, Mr. Chajin Shin. This is part of his presentation, more like or less. The work that's been done by by SOFAC and SPC that you work with open source and Phosphor-G. So you can just read through this, like from 1994, the mail system up to 1996, with USB got involved, so like migrate of 2000, up to 2013. So like, you can see like, SPC is also quite instrumental in promoting Phosphor-G stuff in the Pacific region as well. So that's 2013. So 2017, as I as I mentioned earlier, I got involved with the University of, of University of Fiji, and we talked to OSGO and also to the Geo for All to have a Geo for All lab in the University of Fiji. So this is the University of Fiji site. We donated a server that we had redundant on our on our stack, and we put it and had and hosted it with our Geo for All lab. But like, like most things in my life, like my love for free and open source software for geospatial has been over 20 plus years. I've been through a couple of marriages. So just like more like what happened here, like for a year, it started like going out smoothly. Everything was right. And then all of a sudden there was like a political shift in the university. And somehow this uh, professor was relieved of his duties and the project started to go down and somehow I was fortunate again enough to get involved with, a, with, a, with, with some work back at home in Togo where I was born, to be who I am now, where like, I do, I'm a, more like the runner for this submarine cable company as a, as a CEO. And like, I said, like most things, that I, I, left, I, had to, I had to leave University of Fiji, and I don't know if somebody has taken over this project. Somebody was supposed to take over it, but it's like I said, like, like the initiative that we had for, for the Pacific chapter for, for West Geo, Somehow people just lost lost interest in it, and that's why like we need to approach Oceania chapter. We become the smaller smaller younger brother of Oceania chapter in the Pacific Islands. So, 2018, I started off as the runner or the CEO for Tonga Cable Cup uh, Limited. We are the custodian of the submarine cable that connects Tonga to the Southern Cross. And we are the wholesale of internet capacity for Tonga. You want to talk about that kind of stuff, we can talk about it later. But then, like, I, I fell in love with another technology then, again, last year. So, like, I started getting involved with, we wanted to, we talked with, uh, yeah, there was this other guy who works for, from fisheries in Solomon Islands. He wanted more like a solution for something for tracing tuna and all this stuff, right? And so, somehow, it took us to proof of location in blockchain. So in 2018, we did, I did a presentation for, for the regional blockchain tech camp in Fiji, funded by the US Embassy and USAID. More on the telco side of things, right? But then, somehow, I always think about geospatial stuff. So I kept on reading about it, and there's some sort of like disruptive relationship that we can use blockchain and geospatial tools together. So, if you do a bit of reading about proof of location and blockchain, I just want to bring it down. So, on the blockchain ecosystem, you have some protocols like Forum, Helium, Platon, XYL for mapping and Proof of location for smart contracts, right? At the moment, 
I'm currently working on getting my certification on to be a blockchain developer by January. So these are the kind of stuff that I'll be, that I'm more like moving towards with my, with my career with, with Phosphor-G and geospatial stuff. So like if you're interested about that, we can talk about it later, but this is how I see the technology moving. So like with geospatial and Phosphor-G and also with the blockchain technology. With the TLTs, there are other stuff like Hashcraft and all those other things. But for, for, the, for the moment, this way I see the technology moving. So if anyone is interested in that, we can talk about it later. So 2019. 2018, I was supposed to be in Melbourne, but somehow my visa got a week later. So I didn't have the chance to go. So finally, I'm here. And we also, a part of the project that we are, I've been doing, working on is like, uh, I'm more like I didn't fork it. I'm more like I just worked on top of Lubuntu, which is like a, another version of, of Ubuntu, and created a, a, a distribution for Pacific Islands. More like, and I also put all the geospatial stuff in it with quantum GIS and all these things. So like you can, if you're interested in that, you can find the distribution online. You can download it, test it out. Uh, it's quite cool. It's very light. And yeah. all the physics and stuff. So it, it, there's like, more like this, the current, the latest development I've done as far as geospatial tools is, is concerned at Phosphor-G. And also very, very like proactive in pushing for, for work with uh, blockchain as well. So what do we see beyond 2019? As explained earlier on, we, we, we moved in a direction that we wanted to have an established more like a chapter for OSG or for Pacific Islands. But since we don't have the manpower to sustain that, and I've seen it because like it started lacking towards like last year and this year, we have some, some people in the community that are here now, and we have a city that very, very instrumental in, sorry, not you, and where we see 2020 and beyond. So. We made a bid for Phosphor-G to be hosted in Suva, Fiji in 2020. And we're hoping to see you all there. <laughs> Some of the local organizing committee, the co-chairs is Vasiti and Jonah, and Nick, Nick Rawlings is in it from USB. I'm in it. Elizabeth is in it. Dan, Julie, Chori, Nemaya, and Celeste. Right. So we would like to invite you all. If you have want to see the Fiji and the Pacific Islands, please come come over to Suva for First for G, 2020. Thank you. Questions for Edwin? Uh, God, Edwin, thank you so much for the wonderful and very inspiring presentation. I'm David from another island in the Philippines, in the other side. Uh, I would just want to ask you about what do you think are the, in your career, which is very colorful, very, I see how you try to navigate messy realities. What do you think are the common issues that uh, you faced in making OSGO OpenStreetMap grow in, in the Pacific? If you can name at least the common issues that you had to face each time you were trying to push for the proliferation of our uh, of OSGO and et cetera. I think resistance to change in the Pacific is quite common, especially like if you were taught in a certain platform. And also like another, another aspect of that, like we, we were discussing it last night as well with Greg and yesterday. Well, like, it's kind of like our, our, our fellow countrymen don't trust us, kind of like that. And like, they will, if you walk into a room with, if you're a white guy and I'm, I'm me, they're more like, they're more like to take, to listen to you. So like, 
And also, like some people, they don't want to share data. I mean, like, we like to share solutions, but then some people are quite monkey with the data, but they like the ownership of their own data. So, like, this is part of the reason why we, we promote first 4G and open data, because, like, we want to see this happen in the Pacific as well. So, yeah. Resistance to change is quite common in the Pacific. Pacific Islands are generally caring and sharing communities uh, and there, there are a number of organisations and aid agencies that help um, collate and collect data and information uh, for the Pacific. There are, these are um, held by custodians such as government departments and other organisations and there can be a reluctance to share that information. What do you think needs to, um, how can, um, be assistance be provided and what are your thoughts on the, the data sharing and more towards open source and maybe what this community, how this community can help? Like, as far as this community is concerned, I think that has been the breakthrough that we have in the Pacific, especially with people like, the way I see it, it's gonna be like a bottoms up approach, whereby you, you have a success story from especially with the grassroots people that really do the work, like the technicians. Like the, my experience, with my experience, since the 90s up to the 20s, uh, 20,000 as well, up, up to now as well. If I want to share data, if I go to the top guy, I, I have resistance. So what I do is like, we build this community and technical people share with themselves. So even though like this is protocol, you're not supposed to share that data, but they like somehow, my, I was still working for the Tonga Power Board at the time. Somehow I got to work together with a guy from Tonga Water Board and we shared the data. So we overlaid our data and then we showed them. So like, oh, where did you get that from? No, I got the data from Tonga Water Board. Did you have a problem with it? No, no, but they saw the solution there. So like, this is how it works. So like for, my, for, my, for my experience and what I say, we keep the community vibrant and we work from a bottom up approach and have success stories. And then we have success stories, people on top will finally approve it. 